the other. All right? That means you make this arrow, and then you put the tail of the other one on the head of that one. There's a first arrow is a reflecting arrow from the first surface. And this is the second arrow is the reflecting arrow for the second surface. Now, when you put these two arrows together by this rule, and then look at where, how far off you've come to the end, yes? Yes, you count the pins in the hole. You count the number of beans you put in the barrel. I mean, you make these pictures. And then you ask, how big is the circle? In area. That area represents the probability that you get the thing back. If the circle area is big, then you get a high probability. If the circle area is small, you get a small probability. And I just have to say one more thing of how to make the arrows. Answer. Well, the size of the arrow depends upon the particular materials. I won't come into that right now. The absolute size, the 4%, is another matter. What you do is you make an arrow, and depending upon the time it takes for the light to get from the source where it started to the place where you want to count it, you turn that out like a clock, depending on how much time. So if it takes a long time, you see, you start out at the source. There's the arrow for the source. But that's not, where you go, that's not the arrow you're going to draw. This is just a thinking arrow. And then you say, turn, turn, over the ding, 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 round, 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 depending on how much time it takes. At a certain rate, every second that goes around 75,000, goes around a hell of a lot of times. <laughs> it goes around one followed by 15 zeros. Time in one second. But it doesn't take light very long to get to the, from the source to the thing. So it turns, but it still turns around a lot of times. You turn it around, okay? It's like the roulette wheel. And just at the moment it hits the counter, it happens to be sitting at some angle. All right? And that's for the reflecting from the first surface. Now, what about, that was, the, that was supposed to be this one. I, I've gotten too many arrows on here. What happened is you take the first surface reflection, turn it through at this angle, depending upon the time. And it ends up here. You say, that's not a very big angle. You said it was a big angle. It is a big angle. You know, if you keep on turning, it look, can look like a small angle when you're done, but you had to turn around and around and around and around, around right? You know what I mean. It, it goes around <laughs> like a clock hand after 25 years. It's still saying two can start at 2 and end up at 215. <laughs> That's 25 years. It went around. So here it is, having been turned around a lot of time. OK, this is the, from the first surface, I should say. That's the one, the arrow for the first surface. Now the arrow for the second surface, rule. Same as the arrow for the first surface, but in the other direction. It's just an accident. It happens to be. The opposite direction it starts because, well, not because. The rule will turn out later. When you go from air to glass, it's one way from going glass to air. You change it around. Anyway, <laughs> you start this way for the second surface. And you turn this one. Brrr, no, which way did I turn? Yes. Brrr, 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 for the time. Now, when you get finished with this roulette wheel and the second one, it comes out so. And then you add them together the way I said. You tie one on the other end and make the circle. And that's the laws of elect light. And that'll tell you whether it reflects or it doesn't reflect. And what difference does it make? Why do I get these ups and downs? Well, sure, if you move this, kept that the same and move that, what is that going to do to my exercise over here? Answer. The first arrow, the time doesn't depend upon where the other surface is. Yet. So it does exactly as I did before. I'm doing the same experiment over with the bottom surface a little further along, OK? Top the same place. Now, the second one, however, when I went to turn it, it's a little bit further. It takes a little longer to get there, and therefore it's turned to a new position. So this second time, the picture would look, if the thing was thicker, the picture might look like this. Instead of being here, since it had to turn further, perhaps it's turned to here the second time. And then when I add these two things together, and tie one on the end of the other, and I'll just do that again here. You see that this line is now a long line, whereas before it was a relatively short line. This, remember, was the answer line. The answer line is a longer line, and the area here is much bigger of this circle, and the probability is larger. And this upping and downing, zing, 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 and the answer is, comes out exactly predictable just by this little game. All right? That's a shock, huh? That's, 
You say, yeah, he's going to explain why it's like that. That's exactly what I'm not going to explain. I don't understand it. That's the way it works. The, what I'm going to do in the next lectures is to tell you sort of the generalization of this. Is this a special example for reflection? I'm going to tell you how the rules go about turning arrows. It's in fact somewhat simpler than this example. It's not bad at all. It's easy. It's not hard, but much more generally. And I'm going to, what I've done is this is a prototype of the general result. There is no secret behind it that we can do any better than give you that result. All I'm going to do is generalize it. It's going to sound something like this. This part you needn't understand right away. It's what I'm going to elucidate in the next lecture. The idea goes as follows in general, but just a statement, and I'll come back and do it again, so don't worry. To calculate the probability of an event, which can happen in a number of different ways, the probability of an event is always what we call the square of an amplitude. Walk in this model, it means the size of a circle corresponding to an arrow. An arrow is called an amplitude. For every event, you calculate an amplitude, which is an arrow on a plane. The probability is the area corresponding to that arrow. All right? That's the first thing. Second, how do we calculate the amplitude for an event? If the event is simply a particle going, a photon going from point point to another of a definite color, then it's simply an arrow which turns depending on the time. And that's the amplitude. Notice, by the way, if there's no reflections and no trouble, it just turns, the area stays the same, the probability of finding a photon is not altered. Okay, even though the arrow alters, its area is the same. It's when we get in trouble, when we have more than one way to occur, then the rule goes as follows. If the thing can happen in more than one way, then you find the amplitude. What that was, the arrow, for each way. See, if it could happen in two ways, you got the arrow one way and the arrow the other way, and if it can happen three ways, if it was a double layer of stuff and so on, then you put another arrow for the third way. Maybe that one's a short one. And if there's a fourth way, you put another arrow. And when you're all finished, you put them tail to tail, all the possibilities, and find the total, what we call the total, or the net result of making all these little arrow steps. And that final arrow is a total amplitude, we say, for the event to occur. The probability is, as always, the area corresponding to that arrow. Well, that's kind of stinky, right? Well, it's fun, and it's strange that nature is like that. And I hope you come back to hear how it works in general, a little bit better statement of this to review it. And one other thing, I am going to try to explain to you how this rule explains several of the ordinary phenomena that you're used to in light, such as angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. On reflection, that light bends as it goes to air to water, and it travels in straight lines from point to point, and so on. It's all hidden in that one rule. And how that one rule carries all this information is part of the next lecture, as well as uh, I would tell you right away uh, one more thing, that this rule, that to figure out what happens in nature, you have to calculate an amplitude. is not just for light. It doesn't make any difference what happens. An electron does something. A nucleus explodes. Doesn't make any difference. How do you find it? You can only calculate the probability it's going to happen. And how do you do that? You can guess. You calculate an amplitude. That's a lousy little arrow. And the probability is the square of the amplitude, we call it. That's really, the, we should call it in our case, the circle of the amplitude. The circle that represents the amplitude measures the probability. And that's true not just of light, but of the whole structure of nature as far as we can tell. And although quantum electrodynamics is only about electrons and light, we discovered that part of the rule, at least, is valid also for nuclei, nuclear particles, quarks, and everything else. Uh, the thing that is special about electrodynamics is our complete knowledge of exactly what the rules are for drawing the arrows. But the fact that you have to draw arrows and end up calculating probabilities like that, which is such a shocking and horrible form for nature, is something that I will talk about next time in further detail. Thank you very much. These rotating arrows are all very well.